Welcome to this presentation on my research activities. My name is Andreas Pfennig. I'm part of the group Products, Environment and Processes at the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Liège in Belgium. If you should have any questions on details of the things that I'm talking about, please have a look at this link where you find a list of my publications. Well, before talking about the details and the projects, let me first introduce you to my CV. I have been studying chemical engineering at RWTH Aachen in Germany. After a little less than one and a half years stay with John Prousens in Berkeley, I came back to Aachen to where I did my dissertation on a topic of equation of state with uh, Hugo Hartmann. Then after a short stay with Friedrich Kohler at Ruhr Universität Bochum, I moved on to Darmstadt into the group of Johann Gaube, where I did uh, extend the, the research, so to speak, in the direction of extraction. There I was doing work on aqueous two-phase systems and also, well, on the extractive abilities as well as on the thermodynamics. Directly after that, in 1995, I became full professor again back in Aachen at RWTH Aachen in the area of thermal unit operations. Then in 2011, moved to Graz in uh, uh, Austria and in 2014 moved to Liège. Now let me introduce you to some of the research that I've been doing together, of course, always with my group. So all the slides are more or less prepared by PhD students and collaborators. So uh, they are contributing to all that research as well, of course. One of the topics is solvent and reactive extraction. To give you an idea of how that works, it's shown here. This is a typical pyda plant extraction column. Uh, where you see actually droppers rising. They are, that's an organic phase. At the same time, you have a counter flow of aqueous phase. You don't see the flow, but it's there. So two liquid phases. You see the internals, in this case, sieve trays that are pulsated. They're moving up and down. This is a typical process that is used in chemical industry and other uh, industry industrial branches for separating components. To give you just one example, from orange peel oil, you can extract two components, or you can separate two components by a suitably chosen extraction process. On the one hand side, in the orange peel oil, you have co components that act more like solvents that you can use in eco-friendly varnishes. On the other hand, you have aromatic components that you can lose, use in lemonades. And of course, you don't want to mix that. You don't want to have your solvent in your lemonade. You don't want to have your aroma component in the varnish. So you need to separate that, and that can be done with this piece of equipment. There are many different pieces of equipment available and many more applications in principle. The idea that we follow is that we try to investigate how the individual drops behave. We describe them on a very detailed way and then predict how this overall process is working. How does that work in more detail? This is shown here. The large scale we see over here, the drops are somewhere in the center and we go down even to on molecular scale. So the idea is that we have models that properly describe how the individual droplets are behaving. And we calibrate these models with uh, experiments that we, that we perform on laboratory scale with single drops. So investigate how mass transfer sedimentation and things like that happen for the single drop. The models are taken from the lower scale, so to speak, so that the structure of the model is correct and the parameters characterizing the specific material system, they are fitted to uh, experiments on lab uh, scale. The models are derived from investigations on molecular scale and on, especially here on the interfaces, because we need to know something about the interfaces, because that's actually where the action happens, where the mass transfer is actually occurring across the interface. So we get the models and then we plug the models together to be able to describe what's going on on a pilot plant scale uh, extraction column or even a technical uh, column. Of course, we need to take into account that there are more drops around, that they are interacting with the internals and everything, all, all other effects also that reactions may occur. All that needs to be taken into account and can be taken into account, and it works. I should say it works with an accuracy of 5 to 10 percent, which is quite good as compared, is more or less comparable to experimental uncertainty, so we really can predict what's going on. To show a little bit how we measure these uh, things on lab scale, I've uh, presented this slide. Here you see this a single drop measuring cell for mass transfer measurement. We produce single drops here with a syringe and a nozzle. So this is a nozzle connected to a computer-driven syringe, which pumps an exact known volume into this nozzle so that a drop of exactly known volume is produced, which then rises. 
At the same time, you switch on the countercurrent flow of, of the continuous phase. In this case, this uh, droplet phase is again the organic phase. The continuous phase is the aqueous phase. And in this conical part, we have a velocity profile and the drop rises, so to speak, up to that position where it finds the exact countercurrent velocity that stabilizes it. It. So the sedimentation velocity and the countercurrent flow match so the, that the absolute velocity is zero. So there we can flotate the drop for an arbitrary time. Then we switch off the continuous phase for a short moment. The drop rises. It can be collected here in this funnel. Again, connected to a computer-driven syringe. And then we can analyze the concentration of these drops up here. We have to collect some hundreds of them to get a, enough sampling volume. So we can analyze the concentration here. We know the concentration down there. And from that, we can investigate how mass transfer proceeds. This is shown here. This is the so-called dimensionless driving concentration difference. So it's a constant momentary concentration difference between drop and surrounding phase as compared to the starting conditions. So that's always starting at one and then decaying towards zero. Zero means we normalize it also with respect of the equilibrium value. And there you see that for a given drop diameter as a function of time, for a given drop diameter as a function of time, you get more or less as expected an exponential decay. For the drop de size dependence, you get a very strange function that could be explained, but not in this short presentation. You see the data that we produce and you see the model which is represented by this net, for which we have to uh, fit a parameter to the data that then allows us to describe them with this accuracy. Then we take these models and other models that we need, also based on single drop measurements, that we plug into our simulation tool. And that allows us then to describe how the entire extraction column works. You see here the column, you see that we are modeling also the starting conditions, so the start of, of, of the extraction column. It's a pulse shift rate column. We don't show the pulsation because it would be a little bit crazy on the screen. We get information on the drop size distribution, on the concentration profiles along the column height. And you see here the two phases with the concentration, how they change at the startup of the process. And in the end, they meet quite well with the experimental points, which are shown as dots. And of course, there's some, some numerical output. So that's what is available. And what we are actually working on is that we are extending the applicability of this tool to systems with a higher viscosity. With, well, we, we, it works already for reactions, but we want to improve how that is being described for reactive um, extraction. And we want to take more uh, effects that can occur into account in the models, in the details of the models. And we want to apply that to a variety of applications, of course. So for all the systems we are uh, looking at in uh, cooperation with companies or with other research groups, we are actually always investigating these single drop experiments and predict how an extraction column would look like based on these um, experiments. Then I would like to step to the next topic is it, it is separation of dispersions. Dispersion means that we have a liquid drop phase and as many drops and a continuous phase as before, but now the drops are much more crowded and we want to separate that. Dispersion is entering into this equipment. It's a pilot plant settler, 20 centimeters diameter, roughly two meters in length. And you see that here the drops are sitting on top of each other. Yeah, so and they're, they're, they're joined, so to speak, that's coalescence. They coalesce to become larger drops and even in the end they coalesce to, with their mother phase so that in the end of the process you have two clear phases that you then can feed in the next uh, process steps. That's actually the desired way how it operates. Also here we have a drop-based approach. You want to understand the drops and for that we again have a lab scale equipment which has been designed. Um, and we have a top vessel here where we have uh, stirrers that produce this dispersion. So you fill your two-phase system, two liquid phases into this vessel, you mix it, you stir it, and then you observe how the dispersion that is produced, how that separates after you switch off the stirrers. You can also transfer the dispersion into a second vessel where you, you, you then can investigate the influence of the internals on that. Okay, what to expect? Well, what you can expect is shown here schematically. You see again organic drop phases, uh, drops from organic phase being dispersed. It can also be the other way around, but I have chosen always to show it that way around. So the drops are rising, of course. Then they meet to form this um, close-packed drop uh, layer. Here, actually, the majority of the coalescence occurs until finally they coalesce with the mother phase, and this 
height uphill of the con already coalesced organic phase then increases over time. And you can evaluate now this lower line here. This is, so to speak, the position of the lowest drops that you observe in the experiment. And this is the lower end of, the, of this clear phase that forms on top. And if you plot that as a function of time, these heights as a function of time, you get this so-called sedimentation curve and the so-called coalescence curve. We evaluate them in detail. And for example, from the sedimentation curve, we determine the diameter of the drops. And from the coalescence curve, we determine a coalescence parameter. And with the help of these data, we are then able to really predict how a settler works. And in turn, of course, if there's a certain separation task, we can design the settler, we can say how big it should be. For a real system, it looks like that. This is a real industrial system. Disper dispersion has been produced, and now we are just waiting. And you see here is a time scale of roughly 1,000 seconds. There's a speed fa up factor of factor of 5. And here you see that for the first, I don't know, something of the order, a little less than 100 seconds, nothing happens. And only then a certain thing can be observed. In the, with a speed up factor that relates to roughly 20 seconds or so, where you don't see anything. And only so around now, you realize that down here it is a little bit lighter. Up here it's a little bit darker. So in between, you can guess that here is the sedimentation curve. So this level is moving up. And this is typical for technical systems, that you have fine dispersions, which means you have a very wide drop size distribution. And now you also realize that up here the first bit of clear phase is formed. And so you can now observe how this rises, how that is moving downward and determine these points, fit the data with the model that we have. It's a drop-based model again. Determine the parameters from that, use that to depict what's going on in the technical settler. This is shown here. It's a batch settling experiment or a batch settler that has been simulated here. Height is two meters and the time scale is shown here. And over the height, you see, so to speak, what is happening, the same way of plotting it, but now with a color code. The color code represents the concentration, so to speak, of the organic phase. So this is organic, this is the aqueous phase, and that's somewhere in between. Here you have the closed packed layer. Down here you have polydisperse sedimentation because there are some small drops present. So we account for this polydispersity wide drop size distribution. We see drop, uh, larger drops are moving faster, smaller drops are lagging behind, or so that the higher um, hold up, as we call it, the higher concentration of the drop phase is decaying more quickly than that, uh, that induced, so to speak, by the smaller drops that are lagging behind. And we can depict that and can quantify that exactly and are able to predict really how such a settling process really works. Again, for a variety of, 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 of applications, the, the first one, so to speak, in, in feedstock production is the, if you drill for crude oil, you always get some water with that and you have to separate the crude oil and the water. You do that in such a settler and you are able to predict that with that type of model. The next topic I would like to work on is solvent selection, bio-based process and technical application, which gives you a little bit idea of, uh, of how we apply things to a certain extent. Uh, we are especially interested in bio-based processes because that's sort of speaks the future. If there are no fossil fuels available, well, they are available, but nobody wants to use them because of the CO2 that is finally then emitted into the atmosphere after that has been used and is being discarded, so to speak. So we want to do, use biomass to produce the same chemicals that we are using today, plastics to a large extent, for example. And how can we do that? For that, we need to design processes. And one thing that we are looking at or have been looking at with the, some companies in a variety of projects is that we have a fermentation, a biotechnological process where microbes are producing something. And you want to get that out of the reactor. So this is a bioreactor where you have your fermentation going on. It's a steered vessel, more or less. Then you have a so-called downstream process where you, well, the first thing is to get the product out of the fermentation broth. Uh, for, from the fermentation mixture and this is the first step and after that you can then purify your product. But the, one of the most important things is to get it out. Why is it so important? Well, usually in biotechnological processes there is this so-called product inhibition. That is, the higher the concentration of the product, the slower are the microbes working. So you want to get out the product as fast as possible, keep the concentration as low as possible so that the microbes keep producing. 
Yeah, and that's why you want to have that recycle like that. It's an in situ extraction, for example, so an, an in situ separation in principle, so that you can feed back your fermentation broth from that with the microbes in there and can uh, feed that so that no microbes are getting lost in the process. Our task in the product processes is usually designing this. For that, we have uh, derived a so-called cascaded option tree, which allows us to systematically perform such a development. And this is uh, shown here for different extractions, which so we apply that typically for extraction, but in principle, other separation processes are possible as well. This is done in this case for physical as well as reactive extraction that has been evaluated quantitatively with two different reactive extracts in different uh, diluents, as one calls it, so different combinations of components as this second liquid with which you want to extract things in the organic phase in this case. So you line up all the options. On the other hand side, you define certain criteria with respect to which you want to evaluate the different options. And then we have a color code that describes, so to speak, how well the individual option actually works. Quite naturally, green means it works, yellow means it works so-so, possibly the equipment needs to be a little bit larger or you need to put some more energy into it, and red means it doesn't work at all under any conditions. And you see that in this case, actually, it's a ex reactive extraction of a, a monomer from which has been produced by fermentation that you can then use for polymer production, so plastic production. Uh, you see that there are two options that are more or less almost green with only little limitations. So those would be the first ones that you use and evaluate it more detail, for example, with respect to the economy of the process. So you would make a, a more detailed study on these two options and evaluate the economic feasibility and see one, which one is actually better. This is a very systematic way. It has many other uh, pos positive effects that I don't mention in this uh, short presentation. So that's actually coming out of the many interactions with the industry because we developed that in all these interactions and that was actually quite helpful in the end to clarify many, well, the options and to, to see how to go on with the, with the project. In these biotechnological processes where you extract something from fermentation broth, but also in other processes, it's quite frequent that so-called crud is being produced. Crud is, in this case, some intermediate layer that forms between two phases. Indeed, this is the organic phase. It's a heavy organic phase, heavier than the aqueous phase in this industrial example. And this crud is, in this case, it's a solid stabilized emulsion, a so-called pickering emulsion. And you know how it works. Yeah, you go to your kitchen, you produce a salad, and then you want to have a salad sauce. What do you do? You mix vinegar and, and oil. You shake it, it separates. If you pour that over your salad, it's not so very efficient. So what do you do if you want to produce, for example, a sauce vinaigrette? You add a tablespoon of mustard. Mustard is fine particles, and these fine particles stabilize the emulsion. And so that's exactly what you have here. And that's a nice, uh, this emulsion is now nice to pour over the, your salad because everywhere you have a little bit of vinegar and a little bit of oil. It's a very nice mixture, a very intense mixing of these two phases. And this is exactly what, is ha what happens here as well. But here it's of course detrimental because it hinders the phase separation that we have seen before. If you put that into a settler, even at very low flow rates, it looks like that. So you hardly separate the phases and that layer actually in technical processes builds up over time and then it's, the equipment is clogged and it doesn't work anymore. So you have to stop the process, clean it and so on. So you don't want to have that. And we have actually investigated that. We have investigated the cause for that. We have uh, come up with heuristics, so some rules and options that you have in order to uh, find workarounds, find solutions for that analyze, for example, what actually is the cause for the crud, which components are that, is it really solid, it can also in principle be something else, and all that can be worked out based on the methods that we have developed. Okay, as I said, this is a very frequent problem also in after fermentation, in the first downstream process after uh, fermentation. Something we have also been doing is a process evaluation on a very large scale. Actually, we started that to look a little bit into bio-based processes because we wanted to understand, well, if you're going from fossil-based processes to bio-based processes, things will change. What will change and what do we need to investigate to be ready for designing the processes of the next generation where we use these, uh, the biomass? 
And one way we evaluate, or one thing we evaluate, is the uh, exergy, in this case especially the chemical exergy. First of all, I should say what exergy is all about. Exergy is a horror to all students because it's taught in uh, chemical engineering thermodynamics uh, courses, and it's a variable that is very uh, difficult to understand, actually, in, in details. But one can easily say what it refers to. It refers to that part of energy that can be freely converted into any other energy form. And this can easily be explained. For example, if you have electricity, you can directly ex uh, uh, supply that to a heater and your electrical energy will be uh, converted into heat energy one to one, exactly 100%. If you want to have your, if you want to use mechanical, or convert it to mechanical engineer, you feed the uh, electricity into an electrical motor and you get an efficiency of almost 100% more or less. There are some losses because of real world behavior, but in principle it can completely be converted into mechanical energy more or less. On the other hand side, if you have a heat stream, for example, by com from a combustion process, like in a power plant, if you want to convert that to electricity, the efficiency is only 50%, so you lose 50% of the energy content that's originally in your material that you feed into the power plant. Only 50% is converted. And this exergy exactly takes into account only this 50% that can be freely converted into anything. So that's exactly what we are looking at. And for processes, actually, it determines the minimum energy requirement that you have to run the process. So that's why it is so important. Actually, and here we found, we regard the chemical exergy, which in chemical processes is one of the major contributions to exergy. So that's really the one important part in, these, in describing and evaluating different process options. So this exergy content, which is a chemical exergy content, which is actually the energy bound in the bonds in the, in the molecules, in the chemical bonds in the molecules, is plotted now, evaluated for different classes of materials, fossil feedstock, biomass, intermediates, typical chemical engineering, uh, chemical industry bio intermediates, and final products. products. Products are mostly polymers, plastics, which are the biggest products of chemical industry. And the first thing when we plotted that was that we realized that coming from crude oil over ethylene, or ethene as it's systematically called, to polyethylene, which is one of the biggest industrial processes, it's almost horizontal in the XSG diagram. And then we investigated that and saw, well, it should be like that in case you want to get efficient processes. And that means, in turn, if you start out with biomass, different biomass options, plant oil, it's pretty close to crude oil. So if you there, you can get to this horizontally to similar products. But if you would start from glucose, which is actually quite attractive because glucose can be produced on a small land area to large with a higher yield than the plant oil. So if you start from glucose, Horizontally, you don't wind up here, but here. So you, if you want to have an efficient process, you may go to lactic acid and then to polylactic acid. So PLA is a polymer that you can use instead of polyethylene. Not exactly, but in some cases. So what we learn here is that in the foreseeable future, if you shift from fossil feedstock to biomass as feedstock, it is foreseeable that these components are more likely to be our intermediates and final products because we will shift from these feedstocks to those feedstocks. Plant oil is somewhere in between. As I said, the efficiency is not as good as for the glucose, so there are certain reasons why possibly starting point in the future may be glucose. But, of course, we can't foresee the future. It's just looking at different options and scenarios, so to speak. And what we did now is we looked at the individual processes in more detail to compare that. Reference is the crude oil conversion to polyethylene, and you can start off from glucose. Here the exergy loss over the entire process has been evaluated in, for real processes with data taken from the literature for these individual processes. And you see crude oil to polyethylene, you have only, what was it exergy? You remember, it's the minimum energy input into the process that it works. So this is the minimum energy and input that is needed. Here for the glucose to try and convert that to polyethylene, much more energy is needed. On the other hand side, if you have crude oil to PET, uh, polyethylene terephthalate, which you know is the plastic for the plastic bottles that you have for lemonade, for example. Uh, if you start from crude oil or two different routes from glucose, you see it's quite comparable. So there are competitive products 
being made from biomass to produce a PET and actually that's what you found find already. You have green bottles by one of the biggest companies producing uh, uh, such uh, coca limonades. Uh, they offer green bottles from, not directly from glucose, but well, one pathway is actually going through glucose to PET because you need two monomers to mix them to get the PET, so one of the monomers is indeed produced from glucose. And then the last thing is from glucose to uh, polylactic acid. You see that is even more efficient than getting going from even crude oil to PET. So polylactic acid is a very hot candidate for future uh, plastics. Now, if you look at these things, you realize actually that the properties of these components are significantly different from those that you have in from crude, uh, starting out from crude oil. Because, for example, glucose doesn't evaporate. So you cannot use distillation for the separation of components for purification purposes. It's quite general. Many of the components stemming from biomass are difficult to distill. So liquid-based separation processes like extraction, including phase separation, are likely to become more important in future processes. On the other hand side, you realize that these components lead to significant viscosities of the systems and that's what I mentioned before already. We will see more viscous phases, more highly viscous phases in our processes, so we have to get our tools ready to be able to uh, perform also for such material systems because they are foreseen in, the, for, in future processes. And with the high viscosity, you implicitly also have more uh, a wider drop size distribution, so a wider spread between the smallest and the biggest drops in your process. The higher the viscosity, the wider the distribution, so to speak. So you have to take that into account explicitly as well. And that's exactly what we are doing. And these studies, so to, so to speak, show us in which direction we should be doing our research to be, so to speak, up to date with the demands of tomorrow. We are also doing other things, distillation, fundamentals and thermodynamics, uh, as I mentioned already, distillation. Uh, we did a very interesting industry cooperation with a variety of, of companies, uh, more or less all big companies, chemical companies in Germany were, were involved and even some abroad. Uh, and the point that we have here is that we want to distill systems containing of water and another component. So water, malvoline was one option and the other option is methanol water. And what's plotted is the separation efficiency and because it's an industry cooperation I can't tell you quantitative number is normalized to some reference value um, as a function of the concentration of that mixture. For the water morpholine system you have the blue dots and the water side is here on that side you have the morpholine so you switch from morpholine to water as you move from left to right. And you see for the uh, morpholine system, you are somewhere where this is normalized to, which is a typical value what you would expect. But if you move to the water-rich side, the efficiency of distillation equipment decreases by a factor of two. So you have to build the column twice as high on this end as you would expect if you perform your design with these data, with the typical data that you find in the literature for many other systems. On the other hand side, for the methanol water system, it's worse. There actually the uh, component one is a methanol, so this is the methanol side, and as we move to the left, water is enriched. The oil depends on the vapor pressures for the experts, so to speak, so this is always a light boiling component, that's on the left side the heavy boiling component. So we start out now with, uh, with um, the, um, on the methanol side, have typical values for the efficiency, and then it drops to less than 10% of what you would expect. So if you want to remove traces from methanol from water, you need to build the column, the distillation column, at least 10 times as high, at least for that concentration range as you would expect. And actually in industry it was observed that especially in the water-rich side, the, 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 the distillation sometimes really had significant problems and we investigated that, built models for that and explained a little bit where that is actually coming from beside quantifying this in this way. So there we did some research on, and on the other hand side we investigated uh, phyto extraction, extraction from solid material, in this case from plant material, from which you can uh, produce food ingredients, aroma components, whatever, uh, but you can also apply our methods to any solids from which you want to extract something, for example in urban mining if you have your mobile phones taken apart uh, and finally uh, ground then you can 
leach that with a, a strong acid to remove all the valuable metal components. And then that can also be investigated based on, on, on this, uh, this, these tools and methods that we have developed. That allow us again to predict what's going on in the large scale equipment. Again, the model is built on the individual particles, so we're always looking in the small parts and predict what's going on in the big side. Uh, then, of course, some of the companies with which we have been interacting in the past, mostly German, Belgian and vicinity, uh, well, uh, Switzerland as well. Um, other, uh, and I mentioned only the big companies. We have interaction with many small companies and many actually also universities in Germany and Belgium in very different constellations and different larger projects uh, and also in the rest of Europe mainly. Um, so that's, we are quite, uh, quite interconnected with many other, other groups and companies. To mention um, some of the areas of the application, because so far I've been talking about the techniques, the technologies, the unit operations we are using. Now I want to look at the product, so to speak, because that's the final goal, so where we get the money for typically. So this is a reactive extraction of products in or after the, the fermenter, so in situ. You can redo that inside the fermenter or directly in the next step after that. I've shown that for pharmaceuticals, for active components, for monomers, for plastics production, whatever. Different things have been investigated here. Every, all these things have been really in, indeed investigated. Also for this aqueous two-phase system we have done that. Then separation of metals from urban mining, leach liquor, the leach liquor, how that is produced, and then actually the purification of the different metals that you get from there. Then phosphorus recovery from sewage sludge, also sewage sludge incineration ash. Uh, so that contains lots of phosphorus and actually you would return that phosphorus as fertilizer to, to the field uh, because that is one of the main ingredients in a fertilizer and otherwise you dump it into this, to the oceans. So you want to recover that. And what you are in, in, with the water, so you remove from the water in the corresponding wastewater treatment plants and then you take the sewage sludge and want to treat that further. Unfortunately, that contains lots of heavy metals, iron and aluminum, and you may not apply them to the fields. So you have to remove them. And for that, you know, you use our separation techniques. It can be done by reactive extraction, for example. So that's something we have a big project on in collaboration with many others. Then extraction of active components from plant material is often, often thought as being one of the first steps if you want biomass. First take out what's in there and you can use directly, then treat the biomass further. That's a very typical approach. Uh, then removal of contaminants from wastewater. We have been working on that as well. And finally, this energetic and exergetic evaluation of different bio-based production routes on different levels of detail. I have shown you this exergy diagram as for different groups of, uh, of materials. That is a very broad view. And actually, what I've shown in the next slide, that was on a very process level. Everything was modeled in detail. And we can could even go down to the equipment level, individual pieces of equipment. So that's one thing. On the other hand side, we are, of course, also teaching. And uh, for the teaching, I want, of course, we are doing all the courses related to the topics of our research, unit operation courses, mass and heat transfer uh, courses, for, for, for just to mention some. And we have also a very interesting project that I originally um, initiated many years ago when I was a professor in Aachen. It now took it with me to Graz as well as to Liège. It's the Schnapps project, an integrated project where students actually interact in teamwork, do proper project management and everything, budget management. And what they do is they start out with the fruit, make wine from the fruit and then distill the wine. And uh, so you see here the distillation process ongoing. Here you see the product in one of the bottles and you see the student is sort of very carefully keeping that uh, product. And here you see then the final product, the bottles of the schnapps, uh, everything designed by the student. As I said, teamwork, presentation skills, report, reporting. It's actually by a website that you could find if you search for that on the internet. So that's one, one of our uh, fun projects, so to speak, where actually the students learn a lot, integrate fermentation, distillation, everything, all those things that are called learned as well. With that, I hope that I have given you some good overview over what I've been doing in the past and also some perspectives into the future. If you have questions, as mentioned, please have a look at my uh, publication that you find at this uh, website. 
If you should have ideas for joint projects or have more detailed questions, please feel free to send me an email. If there are not too many, I will answer them for sure. I don't know how many questions there will be coming. As you may have realized, I'm having several videos on YouTube. So far, the email response was not so dramatic, so I, until now I can handle that. So I assume that I will also be able to handle that here from this video. With that, I would like to say thank you, and I hope I've given you some good overview of what I've been doing. Thank you.